It's me. <laughs> the New Testament reading this morning is from Deuteronomy, chapter 24, verses 14 through 22. And you can find it behind me. It's also in your few Bibles, slightly different version of the Bible. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, your light shines within us. Let not my doubts nor my darkness speak to you. Lord Jesus Christ, your light shines within us. Let my heart always welcome your love. Amen. Hear the word of God. You shall not withhold the wages of poor and needy laborers, whether other Israelites or aliens who reside in your land in one of your towns. You shall pay them their wages daily before sunset, because they are poor, and their livelihood depends on them. Otherwise, they might cry to the Lord against you, and you would incur guilt. Parents shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their parents. Only for their own crimes may persons be put to death. You shall not deprive a resident alien or an orphan of justice. You shall not take a widow's garment in pledge. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all your undertakings. When you beat your olive trees, do not strip what is left. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, do not glean what is left. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this. The word of the Lord. Amen. Our gospel reading comes to us from John 3.16 and 17 through 21. Listen again for God's word. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned. Those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Sisters and brothers, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, friends, I am recovering from a cold, so forgive my voice a little bit, but I feel way better than my voice sounds this morning, and I'm grateful that I'm on the uphill battle, because tomorrow, February 25th, I'm going to be celebrating my 26th birthday. <laughs> but it's not good to tell fibs in church, right? But I was 26 when I met Jose back in Colorado. And I celebrate with Jose, an old friend, because just this past week, 
He's been living in the United States for 15 years as a resident alien, and just this past week, he was received as a citizen of these great United States. And oh, I wish you could meet Jose, because he is a giant of a man from Southern Mexico, but he has the spirit of a saint. I wouldn't want to get into a fight with Jose, but even if I did, I don't think he would fight me back because he has the sweetest spirit that I have ever encountered. 15 years he's lived in the United States, navigating the immigration courts in the system. He married a good Midwestern girl, and they are happily married today. And I always thought, hey, if you are a foreigner and you marry a citizen, voila. But I learned that is not the case. You still have to go through a lot of hoops and a lot of attorneys and a lot of courts and a lot of time. 15 years. Jose made the best ever case in your life. And he moved here, he immigrated to the States from Southern Mexico. He was a farm boy. And he carried a picture of his farm and his mom and dad and his sisters and his wallet. And he was always soft spoken. But I worked with his wife at the Presbyterian Conference Center. And on those days when we'd receive one to three feet of snow, he would drop off his wife at the conference center and he would come by our house and he would take an extra two minutes to plow our driveway. And I would say, Jose, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, I can take care of that. It's part of my job. And he would always say to me, but God has called me to love my mother. What an incredible man who loved his family. The reason that he's here in the States is because he has a family to support back in Mexico where he would describe life as poor, but people would struggle to get an education. So he lived in a very meager apartment with him and his wife, and he worked very diligently at his landscaping business in the summer, snow plowing in the winter. One of the hardest workers that I've ever known. And he would take as much money as he could each month to survive here in the States, and ship the rest back to his family. Those people that he loved and cared for because God has called him to love his mother. What an incredible man, but for 15 years, Jose was a resident alien. And if you were paying attention when Janet was talking, she was talking about resident aliens. And in many ways, this notion of resident aliens is a recurring theme throughout our Christian scriptures. Because friends, not only is Jose a resident alien, and millions of others living in the United States resident aliens, maybe they're here legally, maybe they're here illegally, but the scriptures are filled with people who are moving from land to land, nation to nation. We've been talking about one for the past month. Ruth. Ruth is not a good old-fashioned Israelite girl, is she? No, she's from that despised nation to the east. She was brought to Israel by her migrant mother-in-law who had gone from Israel to Moab in search of a better life, back to Israel with Ruth this time in search of a better life that their children might be fed, that their family unit, even though they had died in hunger and in sickness in Moab, came back to Israel that their family might know light and life. But not only Ruth, as a resident alien. As Janet read from the scriptures, in the commandment from Deuteronomy, and also in Leviticus as well, God commands the Israelites who are going into the promised land that you shall leave strips of your lands of the field, you shall leave them for the alien, the widow, and the orphan, so that they might be fed and taken care of. Because remember, you too were a slave in Egypt. 
God's people were resident aliens enslaved in the land of Egypt, brought out from there into the promised land by their redeeming God. And not only is this notion of resident alien an Old Testament usage, but let us remember our Lord Jesus Christ, who Herod had learned that there was another king being born. And Herod demanded the slaughter of all of the children, the male children, to and under throughout the land of Israel. What did Joseph and Mary do with their baby Jesus? took their child to keep him safe and fled to Egypt for the safety of their child so that our Lord and Savior would know life. Indeed, it seems that all of us know these resident aliens throughout Scripture. If you weren't paying attention during Janet's uh, speech. I want to go over this again because it says a lot about the nature of God as we think about these aliens in our midst. God says, you shall not deprive a resident alien or an orphan of justice. You shall not take the widow's garment and pledge. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. Notice that God doesn't say, I highly suggest, since you are good people, that you take care of the poor amongst you, the aliens, the widow. The Lord commands us to seek justice for those on the margins of our society, because remember, your ancestry, you too were a slave in Egypt. Now notice, as we talk about resident aliens, there are also these redeemers who come along to help the resident aliens in Scripture. For Jose, in many ways, his wife came along to help him go through these struggles and turmoils of coming to citizenship. In many ways, Jose's wife was a redeemer. But we've been talking about Ruth all month. Who is Ruth's Redeemer. Anybody? Boaz. Ruth has a redeemer. Boaz. Those ancient Israelites enslaved in Egypt. We could say Moses is their redeemer, right? Or we could say that God is the one who brought them out under Moses' leadership. The sisters and brothers, us good middle class Majority white folks sitting in the audience today. Who is our spiritual? Who is our literal redeemer for us today? Who is that? You sound like a bunch of Presbyterians. Who is our redeemer, friend? Jesus. Jesus is our redeemer who brings us these resident aliens living in a world that is not necessarily under the control of God. Remember uh, when Jesus is in front of Pilate, and uh, Pilate says, are you a king? And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. So if our redeemer is Jesus, maybe it's not just our ancestors who were resident aliens, if we are children of Jesus, citizens of his kingdom, our citizenship is not necessarily of this world. We are American citizens. And as Jose is grateful and would confess to that and cries tears upon receiving his American citizenship, if you were to ask him, he's just a Mexican farmer. Grateful to live in this land, but I wonder if we too are resident aliens living in a land that affords us liberty and opportunity. But friends, who are you and whose are you? Who is your king? Our sermon title is about burdensome social issues this week. 
So many of you, maybe sitting on session, are like, oh no, what's Kevin going to talk about? Is he going to talk about immigration? Is he going to talk about abortion or the sexuality crisis in the Roman church, the Southern Baptist church? What is he going to talk about? Um, in many ways, you've already picked up on it. Roughly 10 days ago, our president of this land, in which I think most of us are citizens, said we have a national emergency on the southern border. Now, I'm not here to talk about the Democrats' policy or the Republicans' policy, but I am here to talk about how us citizens of God's kingdom speaks to the larger culture, government of the United States kingdom. How do we do that faithfully, authentically? So I want us to go to our Redeemer, Jesus, for clues on how we as citizens of God's kingdom speaks to the government of the United States. We know it. We see it at football games. The answer is not far from us. How do we speak John 3, 16? For God so loved the world, not the Mexicans, not the United States, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that, who, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. But the light has come into the world, and the people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that they may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Now, as we debate these social issues, whether they are about immigration or abortion or whatever that the world loves to fight about, and in many ways we say, oh, these are progressive conservative debates or Republican or Democrat debates, that so often gets us into trouble. And we have voices on both sides in the Republican Party and Democratic Party saying, this is the Christian way, right? When we get caught up into our cares, it so often causes division and hurt. So I want to say this. In my sermon today, I don't know that the scriptures can be super helpful as we debate the nuances of public policy today. The land in which Ruth was immigrating back and forth from Moab to Israel, to Judah, is a very different time and place and social location than we see today. So we can't say, oh, there was no wall. Uh, in, in Ruth's day, we should, of course, not have a wall. I think we're comparing apples and oranges, so let us not get caught up into the specifics. But I do believe that as Christians, we have a voice from the king of our kingdom that allows us to speak with authority to the world in which we live. So using the context of John 3, 16 through 21, here are some principles with which we as Christians can speak to this United States where in many ways we as Christians live as resident aliens. The first is this, when we have Christ-centered conversations. We can trust that the scriptures always speak about salvation over condemnation. John 3, 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that we should be saved. God's mission all throughout the scriptures is for salvation. I don't know that I can get any more clear about that, my friends. The next topic that I think that points us as we consider our Christ-centered conversations is that we must know that light illuminates the darkness. And I'm picking up these themes from John 3, 16 through 21, where we see salvation and condemnation, light illuminating darkness. 
And this is where we see in our conversations in the secular world, we see a lot of darkness. Because in the name of our political party or our social position, we will cast darkness on some truths that we would not rather acknowledge that might hurt my argument. Or I might mislead and darken the opposite side's argument so that my argument looks better and we talk in a language of mistruths where we don't acknowledge the reality, the nuances of the world in which we live. Now you might look at my friend Jose and says, Jose, he came across the border legally. Everyone should come over the border legally, right? And that may be a, a valid argument. But friends, not everyone has the resources that my friend Jose has. For many of the undocumented people who are in the United States today, you know, numbers are hard to ascertain because they usually come from the big tank, which is funding them, right? There's a lot of darkness in numbers. But friends, we believe that there are millions of children who are undocumented, who were brought here when they were small, through no fault of their own, and the only life they know is their life in the United States. This is home. What do we do with those children, those DACA kids? I'm not here to say scripture tells us what to do, but I think scripture gives us a perspective of how we engage the conversation. That not all of the people coming across the border are rapists and murderers and thugs. We must be light and speak light in the darkness of the mistruths that are prevalent across all the spectrums of the political world in these United States. And finally, the, the third principle I want to give you today is Christians speaking into our larger society is that we have a principle all throughout Scripture that life overcomes death. This is the message of our Lord Jesus Christ who literally overcomes death. So friends, when we find ourselves in these national conversations about abortion, about the border, about foreign policy, we, as children of the God Most High, Jesus Christ, we ought to be sure that our conversation is focusing on these words on the left-hand side, because if we focus on these words over here, we find ourselves already condemned, right? find ourselves as those who love the darkness and we are already condemned by our own actions. Now you may be saying, okay, this is great for the national conversation, but the reality is that these principles are more important, not just for how we speak about abortion or the border, but how we live our lives. How we have those internal conversations with ourselves because you hear those voices in your spirit, don't you? The voice that says, you're not good enough. The voice that says, oh, that person is only in it for the money. The voice that says, oh, this world is going to hell in a handbasket and I just need to do what I do to get ahead in this life. You hear those voices. Sometimes I say. But if we can move and shift our perspective to hear the voice of Jesus Christ who says, I have come to save your life. I have come to spread light and I have come to give you life. And this is what you should be doing with your life as a child of the Most High. This internal conversation has the ability not only to change your spirit, but friends, does this Christian-dominated country in which we live, if we were to abide by these principles, we could shift the spirit of this country. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm not sure you believe it. <laughs> Friends, 
is these principles of Jesus <coughs> have the capacity to save our life. I remember my resident alien, now citizen friend, Jose, and how he would take out his wallet and show off his finger. And while being grateful for his citizenship, he would always say, this is why I work so hard. This is why I do it. And tell me about his father and his mother and his brother. Friends, I'm hopeful that as we go throughout our lives, that we would come up to the friends on the street and pull out our pictures that might look something like this. We say, as a child of the God most high, this is why I work so hard, spreading salvation and light and life. Friends, may you remember the king of your true kingdom, Jesus Christ, and how he has called you to light and to life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.